had to share this. I've been wanting to share this on my channel. Hey there friends, welcome back to another video and another week of many things on the to-do list. Some of my goals for today's video are to do some weekly meal prepping. I know you guys haven't seen me do that for a little while, just getting some things prepped for the week and that is so convenient. I also wanna give you an update on my indoor lettuce that I've been growing and we planted in my last video. But before we do all of that, we've actually been having some colds and coughs around here. It's that time of year and so I'm always looking for natural remedies to help boost our immune system and that sort of thing. So we're actually going to make some elderberry syrup. Um, it's very simple and you can get all of the makings, the ingredients on Amazon. I will leave them linked below um, to put this together. So I have a little saucepan back here and we're just going to take about two cups of water and put it in to a saucepan. Now there are a few little variations that you can do. If you look up elderberry syrup on Pinterest, you're gonna find different recipes. I'm just giving you the one that we like the most. So two, two cups of water, you could obviously double this if you have a really big family. Um, but I really like the idea of having my dried elderberries on the shelf and just making up the amount of syrup that I want at a time. You don't really want to store this longer than about four weeks in the refrigerator. So being able to just make up a small amount as we need it is more my cup of tea. So we're going to take a third cup, isn't this measuring cup so fun? Um, we're gonna take a third cup of dried elderberries and I really want to plant um, a nice elderberry bush someday because they are so easy to grow. They grow really well in the wild here in central Pennsylvania. So there's not a lot you have to do to them and you can actually propagate off of a wild elderberry bush. Um, so we're gonna take about th one third cup of elderberries to this. We're gonna put this on a medium heat. Now, this is where you can kind of start to play around with what works best for you. Some people will put powdered cinnamon um, into this. Personally, I don't really want the texture of powdered cinnamon in my syrup. So to be able to get the same benefits but not have to have the texture, I'm actually just going to put two sticks of cinnamon and I love the fact that I can get big bags of organic cinnamon sticks on Amazon and they last a very long time in storage this way. And I have a jar sealer that I just kind of seal um, to make these airtight so that they store even longer. Now again, some people put powdered clove into this mixture. Uh, I'm not gonna go into great detail of the benefits of all of these things. If you look them up individually, they, you will find out the immune boosting benefits or just simply the things that help you get better from colds and whatnot. But some people put powdered clove. I'm actually going to go ahead and pick out about, oh, four to six whole cloves in this. Um, if you have really small children, this is going to add a little bit of heat to this mixture. Um, you may want to do kind of adjust it to your, I just dropped one. Um, you may want to adjust it to your family's needs, but we're just going to put this in here. And then of course it will get strained out when we're good to go. Now I do want to add some ginger to this. So I'm going to grab some of that out of my refrigerator because I have fresh ginger root. We're going to slice and put in this as well. All right, you're going to take a roughly about an inch size piece of ginger root. You do not need to peel it for this. And we're just going to slice it and put it into the pot. All right, we're going to bring our syrup to a simmer. We'll get back to that in just a second, but I'm going to share with you this week's sponsor and that is Equip. Equip is going to help bump up my little coffee break here and give my coffee so much more than just using creamer. We are gonna go ahead and put a scoop of the vanilla grass-fed beef isolate protein. And I'm so excited to share this, mainly because I have went through seasons of my life where I've done a lot of dairy-free eating. And this is a great dairy-free protein option that's going to give you so much more than just protein. Prime Protein is an all-natural grass-fed beef protein that provides the nutrition of four ounces of beef. 
a full 20 grams of clean protein in each scoop. It contains collagen and gelatin that repair your joints and soft tissues, plus promotes the health of your hair, skin, and nails. I have personally in the past had whey protein create inflammation for me, so I know that this prime protein is a great option. Not only does this give me a nice quick way to get protein in my busy day as a mom, but it also tastes really great and comes in a variety of flavors. Equip is giving my viewers an incredible offer. Head to my link at equipfoods.com forward slash Adeline Zook and use my promo code Adeline Zook to get 20% off your first order or even better combine this offer with a subscription and get 35% off your first subscription. All right, so you're going to let your elderberry syrup simmer until it's kind of reduced, I would say about 50%. So if you start off with about two cups worth of liquid, you're gonna hit around a cup of liquid. And I have a bowl here with a strainer sitting in it. And this is where if you had the powdered cinnamon, you could maybe run it through some cheesecloth or a coffee filter or something like that. But we're just trying to make things easy by using the whole um, forms of the clove and the cinnamon. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off and it is simmering so it's pretty hot. And I'm going to strain this into here. And by the way, this smells so good. It's just like such a great fall type of a scent. Um, it has the cinnamon in it. It's making my house smell absolutely delicious. So I'm just dumping this. Now you wanna be careful that you don't get this on your clothing, which I'm hoping that I haven't gotten any drops on me, um, just because it can stain. It's a berry and a very deeply colored berry. But you're going to wanna scrape all of your berries into the mesh strainer because you're going to want to press on the berries just to get every last bit of the juice from them out. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and take my spoon and press really well, just smashing everything around to make sure we've squeezed all the goodness out. And we've got our big, like you can see how it stained the ginger, even a purple color as well. And then we're going to add honey to this, but not yet. I'm going to allow this to cool on the counter until it is to the point where I can comfortably touch it um, because we don't want to heat our a raw honey really hot. We'll lose some of the benefits of this raw honey if it is really heated at a hot temperature. All right, so this is a little warmer than room temperature, which is perfect to uh, dissolve the honey. We don't want to cook it, but we're going to dissolve it. And I am not going to get out a measuring cup to measure this, but I'm probably gonna put around a half cup to a third of a cup of honey in this. And I'm just going to go ahead and eyeball it. Now, we pretty much all know that honey is a good cough suppressant. Um, it helps out with many, many things, including allergies, as long as it is a local honey. And so I'm just stirring this in. I'm going to just kind of whisk it until I don't really feel any of that honey on the bottom. And I just have a jar here and I have an airtight lid as well that I'm going to be just pouring this into. Um, I actually, to be honest offhand, I don't know the exact uh, dosages of this. So I will be sure to leave that with the recipe below so that you know how much to take in a day or you know how much you are giving family members and that sort of thing. So I'm gonna go ahead, it really smells so good with the raw honey. It just has such a great flavor. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour this in here. I may regret not having a funnel. We will see, we will see, but I'm gonna put it in here and then we're gonna transfer it to the refrigerator. All of my honey definitely dissolved right into that. I don't have any little pieces left. And we have a wonderful helper in this cold season. All right, we are going to get back to a few home remedies a little later in this video, but I want to get started in on my weekly 
meal prep and I have some really great recipes to share with you today. I'm actually going to start out by doing a recipe called Dad's Favorite Breakfast Casserole. This is something that I can make now and then we can just reheat it through the week as a quick breakfast. Breakfast time, if you guys have been around for a long time watching my channel, then you know that breakfast time is one of my favorite things to prep for just because it's hectic, it's busy, whether you homeschool or not, we homeschool and usually we're trying to get our school day started. There's many things going on in the morning. <laughs> and so being able to have a quick breakfast is very nice. So while I'm chatting with you here, I'm actually going to cut up three cups of cubed bread. Now this, I am using a sourdough loaf here. We tend to enjoy that a little more in our house just because it's easier on the tummies. Um, it's a little easier to digest. And so that is why I'm choosing sourdough. I actually have gotten a couple of questions in the last little while about how I store my sourdough loaf in this cake stand and whether or not it stays fresh and whatnot. And it is a fairly heavy glass top. And so I feel like it stays mostly airtight and does a really good job of storing my bread. So to answer the question, yes, it does a great job. And I actually can link um, the cake stand below. So I'm just cutting this into, I don't even know what size I would consider this to be, maybe about an inch to a half inch cubes. And I'm just going to fill my measuring cup here up to the three cup line. Okay, so now that we have our sourdough all cut up here, and I'm gonna put my loaf back in here. So that's where we grab from for toast and things like that. I have a greased nine by 13 pan, and I just greased it with avocado oil. And I'm going to go ahead and just toss these bread cubes in here. And then we're gonna focus on what we're gonna pour over this. Now, this is extremely customizable. You can do whatever you want um, when it comes to the proteins or whatever your family most enjoys. I'm going to be putting 12 eggs into the bowl. And then we have two cups of milk here that we're gonna whisk in with this. You can do salt and pepper. And all of these recipes are actually coming out of a Amish cookbook. I'll share with you about that here in just a minute, but this is a very common uh, breakfast casserole, at least that I would have grown up with, and my parents are a Mennonite background, as most of you know. So I am very familiar with this type of a breakfast casserole out of this cookbook. So we are going to be doing some sausage. I actually just fried up before, in between filming off camera, I fried up a pound of sausage from a pig that we've gotten locally. And you could do ham. I think that's actually what's on the picture in the cookbook here. And, um, or you could do bacon, or you could do even like a lunch meat ham. You could chop that up. Um, you can really do whatever you want or whatever your family wants. Also, instead of salt and pepper, you could do farm dust. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. That's pretty commonly used in Amish and Mennonite cookbooks as well. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead to my 12 eggs, add in the milk, and this is just whole milk that I'm using here, and the salt and pepper, and the measurements are all in the recipe and you may want to adjust the salt just a little bit if you're using ham just because ham will tend to be a bit more salty than um, just a plain sausage i am just whisking the milk and eggs together here and i have preheated my oven to 350 or it's working on preheating and i'm going to give this a really good whisk getting all of the yolks really broken up all right, so now what you're gonna do is just pour the egg milk mixture over top of your bread. And obviously remember to grease that pan <laughs> where everything's gonna stick. 
Now next what we're gonna do is actually take the ground sausage or whatever meat, whatever breakfast meat you prefer, and we're going to just put it over top of the layers that we have so far. Now we're going to take a stick of butter, which <laughs> if you're familiar with Amish recipes, butter is so often the friend to Amish recipes. And we're just going to take it, I have a really big knife here, and I'm going to just chop it up into little cubes. We're gonna just put this over top of the pan, um, just kind of randomly. It doesn't have to be perfect or anything, just because it's all going to obviously melt and soak into that bread. Okay, now we're gonna add a very light layer of cheese. Most of you know that I pre-shred my own cheese normally, but someone gave me two very big bags from Sam's Club, actually. Um, they just gave them to me, and so I want to definitely use these up. They are just like a Mexican-inspired cheese mix, um, which will go great on this casserole. Now we are gonna put more cheese on this, but after it's had some time to bake. So I'm gonna pop this in the oven for about 45 minutes. All right, so as usual, I'm starting to get a couple different things going here. So we put the breakfast casserole in the oven. I have about two pounds of ground beef that I am frying up back here that we will get back to for something else here in a minute. And then I'm going to go ahead and start some sweet potato rolls. I'm really excited about making these. I've never made them before. So let's just hope that everything goes well. And this is out of the same cookbook as dad's favorite breakfast casserole. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and put the yeast combination. So I'm getting this started now. Uh, because it needs to sit for a couple of minutes and with the oven already going that's one thing I try to do if I'm going to make something with yeast I try to start baking something else so it warms up the kitchen and it helps that yeast activate a little bit better Another little trick I have for you is I store my yeast in the freezer It lasts a whole lot longer and it seems to have a really quick reaction time whenever it hits the warm water so in the bottom of my stand mixer here, I'm doing a fourth cup of warm water just from um, the tap water because we have a well. And then I'm going to go ahead and also use a tablespoon of yeast and a teaspoon of sugar. So I'm gonna do the sugar first because we kind of want it to be like sugar water. So we're gonna do sprinkling the teaspoon of sugar. I may even give that a little stir so it starts to basically make a little sugar water in there. And then we're going to go ahead and sprinkle in our tablespoon of yeast. I even have some ice crystals on my yeast. <laughs> and then we're gonna let this stand about five minutes. All right, so since we have a couple of minutes here to wait for the yeast to activate, We've got something on the stove, we got something in the oven, we're rolling on many things here. I wanted to tell you all about this cookbook. It is called Creative Cooking and it is made by five Amish sisters. And I get asked very, very often for cookbook resources when it comes to Amish and Mennonite cooking. Um, like I said, my parents both have a Mennonite background and when I was little, um, we were as well. And so I often get asked, and I have shared other cookbooks in the past, but the exciting thing that I have to share about this is number one, I think this cookbook is really, really awesome. It's got pictures in it, which if you are familiar with Mennonite and Amish cookbooks, many of them are very old and don't have pictures. I think I looked through here and every single recipe, here is our sweet potato rolls, you can see them on the page, every single recipe has a picture, which to me 
That motivates me so much more to make something when I can see a picture of what it's like. And then the other thing I really love about this, this particular cookbook is that it has a lot of basic recipes when it comes to Mennonite and Amish cooking. Mennonite and Amish are two different things, but when it comes to their cooking, it's almost the same thing. Um, the whoopie pies, other things I shared in the past and things my mom has been on here and shared, they're all very, very similar, would eat very similar meals, do all the home canning, home preserving, and that sort of thing. And so in here, there is a whoopie pie recipe and a pumpkin whoopie pie recipe and many other, what, I, what should I say, maybe like famous Amish and Mennonite recipes, a lot of basics are in this. And I think that's really great. The recipes are very easy to follow. So we are going to be continuing on with this, but I do wanna let you guys know that I will link this cookbook below as I always link my recipes and the sources um, for you all. And I'll even have a discount code there to a Christian Mennonite owned bookstore that services central Pennsylvania and beyond and you will have a discount code to their website that you can find this cookbook. So back to our cooking. Um, I'm just excited to have a great resource to refer back to on a lot of recipes that I just simply have because my mom gave them to me but they are also in this book. So great way to share, spread the love and share it for these um, Amish sisters that made this book. All right, so our yeast is almost ready. And if you are new to making things with yeast, doing very simple breads and rolls is a good way to practice using yeast. Now this does have sweet potatoes in it and I was really excited to see that. It's something that our family enjoys is sweet potatoes. My mom grew up making certain rolls and breads with mashed potatoes. So potatoes bring a really nice texture and flavor to rolls and breads. So I'm going to actually get something to fish some of these sweet potatoes out of here. We're gonna need about one cup's worth of sweet potatoes mash. I just wanted to give you a close up of what the yeast look like, looks like when it's activated. So you can see it's very foamy looking in there and that's what we wanna see before we start mixing in the rest of the ingredients. All right, so now what we're gonna do is add in our sweet potatoes to the yeast and sugar water mixture. Now I'm actually going to be using two different attachments for my mixer. You could do this all by hand. Just look up how to um, make bread by hand without a mixer and you could just follow this recipe with the instructions on how to do it by hand. So I'm actually gonna use this, it would be I think considered a paddle and then we'll switch to the bread hook once we're working with the flour. So I'm going to go ahead and attach this on and then to all of this we're also going to add in three fourth cup of warmed milk. You don't want it hot or you're gonna kill your yeast, but just not cold. We don't want, uh, when you're working with yeast, warm is better than cold. So the other thing I have here is I also have a half cup of melted butter. So we're gonna go ahead and add that in as well. I'm hoping that's not too hot. I think we're good on that. And we have the sticky situation of a fourth cup of honey here. I'm gonna do my best to get it all in the bowl. Honey is so fun to measure, isn't it? But I love being able to use my raw local honey from a farmer that we get not far from us. To this, we are also going to add one egg and then two teaspoons of salt. I'm going to make sure that this is all really well combined before we start adding in the flour. All right, so now that this has been combined pretty well, I'm going to make sure that I don't have any ingredients stuck to my, 
mixer paddle here. And then I'm going to swap this out for the dough hook because now we have all of the ingredients in here except the flour. And this recipe takes six cups of flour. And so I just have my cup measure back here. We're gonna work on slowly incorporating the flour. I'm probably gonna add in about half of the flour and we'll start to mix it and then we'll slowly add in the rest of the cups. All right, so here is what our dough mixture looks like. I love that it has a bit of a tint to it. You can see that it definitely has some sweet potato in it. So what we're gonna do is we're going to just take a tea towel, flour sack towel, um, something that is not gonna be airtight on here. We're just gonna cover it. I'm gonna set it on the stove top since we've already, not with the stove top on, just along or next to the stove. Um, since it's already on, and we're gonna let that rise till it's double in size, so somewhere around there. So that get, let this get nice and puffy in here while we're working on some of our other things. This may come as a bit of surprise to some of you, um, just because the Amish and Mennonite are both sort of known for do-it-yourself type people, people that make their own things, um, craft their own things and whatnot. But there is one invention, <laughs> if you can call it an invention, through the years that the Amish and Mennonite have really jumped on, and that is using Velveeta cheese. Um, it is in this recipe, it's actually the cheese that is recommended to be used. However, I personally very, very, very rarely use Velveeta cheese, um, just for health reasons. And so, I am using my own cheese blend. So I just was going to make a comment on that, that if you are going to start using some Amish and Mennonite cookbooks, you don't have to use Velveeta cheese. Um, you can definitely use whatever type of cheese you want to. And like I said, I don't even normally use cheese like this, pre-shredded, but like it was given to me. I have about, I think it was like seven pounds of this shredded cheese and I just could not pass that up and I am finding ways to use it. So this is supposed to be a very cheesy top. Um, you can see it by the picture, especially if it was Velveeta, it would be very melty and cheesy. So with that being said, I'm going to really pile it up here and I'm gonna pop this back in the oven for just a few minutes, just to get that cheese to really nicely melt. Um, over top of the casserole. And I mean, I'm gonna be honest, our family loves cheese. So <laughs> they're going to love this being very, very cheesy. Doesn't this just look so beautiful? I am so excited to feed this to my family this week. I'm actually going to be setting this aside in the dining room to cool off before I put it in the refrigerator and we're able to just scoop out of it as we need it through the week. The next recipe we're going to be working on is some cheeseburger soup. My husband grew up going to a small Mennonite school and this is something when they would have a hot lunch, that's what they called it, um, that was often brought in was cheeseburger soup. And there's a couple of variations and I think it's a more popular recipe. Overall, a lot of people make it. Um, so we are going to go ahead and put that together. That's what I was frying the beef for. Let me stick this out to cool and then we will pull out the rest of the ingredients for the soup. So one of the things I always love to share with you all is how to work with recipes. If you don't have exactly what the recipe calls for, there's so many things that you can alter and change in recipes and work with them, especially when it comes to cooking. Baking is a slightly different story just because it's pretty sciencey. There's things that have to react off of each other when it comes to baking. But when it comes to cooking, it can be a little bit different. So we are actually going to swap up the recipe just a little bit, um, changing it out of what is in this cookbook that I'm sharing with you all today. 
And one of the things is that it calls for water and then adding in a powdered chicken stock base. And that is something that I do see fairly often in Mennonite and Amish cookbooks. However, I have my own homemade chicken broth and I don't even keep um, stock base around. And so I definitely am going to use up obviously what I have on hand and not go out and buy something extra. So instead of four cups of water and a tablespoon of chicken stock base, we are just gonna add four cups of chicken stock that I have on my shelf already. What I'm doing, and this is slightly different also off of the instructions, is I'm actually going to saute the veggies in the bottom of the pan first and let them sort of cook together and make a nice base in the bottom of the pan before I add in the broth and all of that. We'll get into that as we go through this. So I have some frozen onions here. You all know if you watch my freezer meal preps, how much I enjoy freezing garlic and onion. It's just something that is so nice to have on hand and to not have to go through the bother of either mincing garlic or chopping onions every single time you cook because it seems like they are in a majority of recipes. And so having these basics on hand and really quick to go, there was a cup of onion that I did not have to go through the bother of chopping up. It's all ready to go. I'm just gonna throw it in with these uh, carrots and celery. So I know I just said this about the sweet potatoes, but having canned potatoes on hand just makes recipes go so much faster. So I'm going to take these two jars of canned potatoes. I'm actually going to rinse them really well in this strainer, and then I'm just gonna dice them up smaller to go into the soup. I am taking a minute while the veggies are still getting soft to refill my salt canister that I keep near my stove. And I wanted to tell you that my plan for this soup through our week is pretty much lunches along with the sweet potato rolls. I think it would make a great lunch. There's veggies in the soup. We have the protein from the beef. We've got basically a one pot meal, but it's always fun to have some kind of crusty bread or a roll to dip in to your soup. So that's my plans for what we are currently prepping. I haven't been prepping dinners quite as often as I was at one point. I kind of go through phases of it and it just depends on what you have going on in life, of course. And lately we've just been making dinners in the evenings and it's just nice to have things prepped for busy days for lunches and breakfast. All right, so now that my veggies are softened in the pan, I'm actually going to remove them so we can make the creamy part of this soup, since it is a cream soup. And we are going to actually kind of switch up the rules to this recipe. So initially they said to cook these veggies in that stock mixture that I was talking about earlier but I wanna use one pot to do all of this. And so instead of pulling out a saucepan and making extra dishes, we're going to go ahead and just remove these veggies and then we'll add them back in after we've made the cream portion. 
All right, I pulled you up closer to my messy stovetop here to show you how I'm going to do this. And I've shown this a lot. This is a simple skill um, that as somebody that w desires to create homemade meals is something that you should definitely know how to do. I'm gonna grab a whisk. So for this recipe to make this cream base, and I believe this is also called a roux. You can let me know in the comments if you know a bit more of the technical term to this. But we are just going to melt a stick of butter as you see me doing here. And I did turn my heat down just a little bit from sauteing the veggies because we don't want it too hot. You want definitely some heat to do this, but you don't want it too hot. Now, you can use regular flour, but I have found that using gluten-free flour doesn't really change the results of making this cream base. So to the stick of butter, we are going to add 3 4th cup of gluten-free flour. All right, I like to show this nice and close if I can because you don't wanna panic. It's gonna get clumpy whether you use regular flour or gluten-free flour, and that is what you wanna see. You want it to get kind of pasty and clumpy, and then we are going to make sure we've got our milk measured out and nearby because that is going to be the next step to this is to add in the milk. So there's all of my flour. I'm just going to make sure it's totally um, soaked up that butter. You can see it just kind of looks like a paste now at this point. Now this is where you wanna have your milk ready to roll because you don't want that flour to start burning to the bottom of the pan. Now, this is four cups of milk. We are just going to slowly add it in. And as you do this, and as the flour butter mixture melts into the milk, it's actually gonna get thin again. <laughs> the sauce, if it's your first time making it, there's lots of panic moments in this. Um, am I doing this right? promise you're doing it right. So it's going to look very thin and milky and you're just going to let it get to a simmer and you're gonna to continue to whisk it as it gets to a simmer and you're going to notice it start to thicken up. And we're just gonna give this a few minutes and I'll bring you back. Okay, while we are waiting for this to get the heat, I turn the heat up just a smidge um, while we're waiting for this to start to thicken, get a little bit bubbly in there, I'm gonna go ahead and shred up this cheddar cheese. This is a half pound of cheddar cheese. I would prefer sharp cheddar in this, but this is what I have in a half pound block, and so I'm gonna use this up. Now, you might be saying, you have all that shredded cheese, why aren't you using that in this? So, I have found when it comes to melting, <laughs> cheese, I really, really prefer, like if you're gonna use it in a sauce, I should say it that way. If you're gonna use it in a cheesy sauce, which that's pretty much what we're doing in this soup, um, I prefer to shred my own because the things that they put into the cheese to keep it from sticking together sometimes can kind of prevent the cheese from melting very nicely. And this recipe, once again, <laughs> calls for Velveeta cheese. And I think that's what a lot of people would put into a cheeseburger soup. Um, but like I said, I so rarely ever buy it and this is what I have to use. So this is going to do a great job. I'll just have to make sure I stir it and make sure that it all gets nicely melted into the sauce and the cheese. All right, so you're going to be able to see now that this is a very thick, creamy sauce. So into this, I'm going to be adding the cheese. We're gonna get that melting to make that sort of Velveeta looking um, creamy cheese. <laughs> Since this doesn't melt quite as quickly as Velveeta, I'm just going to continue to really whisk this, stir this in. I'm also gonna open up my jar of broth at this point too, so that I can slowly add it into this and sort of make our soup base before we add in the meat and the veggies.
So as you can see, this makes a nice big pot of soup, which I'm not at all surprised about. Um, most Mennonite and Amish recipes uh, tend to be geared more towards larger crowds, bigger families, that sort of thing. And having a mom that cooked with these recipes all of my life, I really was in for a surprise whenever I started finding recipes online soon after I got married and was trying new recipes because a lot of times I thought the cake was supposed to fit in like a nine by 13 pan. A lot of cake recipes are really only for like an eight inch by eight inch um, pan that are outside of the realm of the Mennonite and Amish. So it's not surprising that this makes a very big pot of soup. And it's interesting because a lot of other soup recipes that I find on Pinterest and things like that tend to make, you know, maybe about half of this pot of soup versus this is one recipe and we have a really big pot of soup, which is excellent. We will eat it throughout this week and in a couple of days, if I'm seeing it not get eaten up quite as quickly, I will just put it into either some freezer bags or into some freezer containers and we will be freezing it because it's really simple to do that and have it for another week. Okay, our dough has about doubled and so I'm gonna get these out and shape them. It seems to be pretty workable dough. I don't think I'll need to add anything to it. I'm gonna kind of punch it down because these are gonna rise one more time. And if you are super intimidated by the idea of bread, working with yeast, that sort of thing, please don't be. Honestly, I was for a long time, even though my mom grew up in a bakery um, and taught me different things, it just seemed very intimidating. And all I can say is give it a try. If you fail, you'll learn something and it's really not as hard as it may seem, especially if you have good instructions and can just simply follow those instructions, it should go fairly well for you. Okay, so I'm going to make 12 rolls out of this. One thing I'm noticing about this bread is that it is definitely a bit more on the dense side, um, which I'm assuming is because of the potatoes. So we will see. So I'm kind of dividing this out so that I've got somewhat even rolls. It's not really like it's that important if they're slightly uneven. And I'm really, really hoping that this is not meant for 24 rolls. It doesn't give me an amount <laughs> um, for these rolls. And so I'm really, really hoping that I'm not going to end up with some massive dinner rolls, but we will see. Okay. So when we make a roll, this is why I have you in here nice and close so you can see what I'm doing. The simplest way to do this is essentially just to continuously tuck your dough until you have a nice smooth top. So we're just gonna do it like this. I'm going to set this in here. I have a greased pan over here. I'm going to go ahead and repeat the same process until we have 12 nice rolls and I think it will fill out this pan very nicely. All right, how beautiful do these already look? I am so excited to let these rise once more. So I'm just gonna take the same um, flour slack cloth and cover these up. We'll set them over here by the stove and I'm probably not going to let them quite double, but we'll let them get nice and puffy in this dish while they sit over here next to the warm oven. All right, friends, we're taking a little water break while our rolls rise. And in case you're like me and you forget to drink water, 
This is your little memo, especially if you're listening to this video while you're getting things done around your house. So I wanted to give you a little update on the indoor lettuce that we started in the last video I posted, and it is sprouting. I actually need to do the second round of thinning the sprouts. I already did it once whenever the sprouts started to come up, and then I need to do it again. Plus, I've started another project in the meantime, so I'm gonna take you in here and just show you a little update on everything. And I think when I initially posted my last video, I forgot to link the tower planters. So I will be sure to do that in the description of this video so that in case you were looking for it, you will find them. And let's flip the camera around and I'll show you what I got going on. All right, per usual, this sunroom is just basking in its glory <laughs> in the afternoon like it is right now. And, um, you all saw me plant these. This is another project. I actually labeled them on the end here. So this is radish. It all needs to be harvested. I know it should have probably been harvested yesterday, but so be it. This is what we got going on. We have kale here, and then the bottom is a salad greens mixture of microgreens. These are microgreens. Um, you do grow them in dirt. That's what they're in is a really, thin layer of dirt. They grow very, very fast. And um, you just make a salad with them. We've also been doing some sprouts too. And then this is my lettuce, which this is what I was talking about. We are to the point of needing to thin some things out here. And we're also going to go ahead and feed these. But I am just thrilled with how they are looking. And I'm excited to see if we can actually get them to maturity in this type of planter with what I'm using um, to encourage them to grow. So let's take a minute, I'm gonna get a little bowl and I'm just gonna go through it and thin them. In case you don't know what that term means, it just means when you plant seeds, you generally plant over plant. And there's not enough space in the soil um, for all of those sprouts to grow. So you have to thin out some of them so that some of them can mature and grow into full size plants. All right, so the tip I received from the greenhouse is to use liquid seaweed. There is actually something else called liquid fish, and the girl I was talking to that obviously had way more knowledge than me on indoor plants and growing things inside, um, strongly advised to use the seaweed because it has very mild smell and the smell that it does have goes away very quickly. There, the liquid fish on the other hand, she said that I would smell that very consistently in my house. <laughs> However, I do plan to try to use it in my outdoor gardening this next spring. So we have a gallon of water here and we are gonna add about two tablespoons of this stuff. Now this is an organic fertilizer and honestly I would say if you start out with pre-fed organic dirt, soil, whatever you like to call it, um, you might be fine. But I actually recycled some potting soil that I used in something else at, for these planters so I knew that my soil would be lacking in nutrients and I knew it would need something. So that is why I'm giving this a try. Um, we're gonna put about two, it's black. <laughs> we're gonna put about two tablespoons of this and I'm just gonna put my measure in the dishwasher. Um, we're gonna put about two tablespoons of this into one gallon and then because I have sprouts obviously that I'm working with, these are not full size plants and we don't wanna take a gallon pitcher and dump it into those planters. They will wash away my sprouts. So I'm actually gonna use this little watering can. This is what I've been using. I use this for my house plants quite often. It's so nice because it has this really small sprout, spout, sprout. Ooh, we are getting later in the day. <laughs> it has this nice little spout that I can kind of drizzle the water over the area and we're not gonna overwhelm our plants. One thing I am going to do is I'm actually going to wait just a little bit to do this because 
the sun is really beating on those plants and I don't want to water them while the sun is really on them. It's not a really good, great idea. You can end up burning your plants by doing that. But I may here after a bit push those over since they're on wheels and get them kind of out of the direct sunlight and then water them. All right, so heading back to our cold remedy suggestions, and obviously I'm no professional. These are just little things that we've done for our household, especially the last uh, week or so, we've had some head colds and some coughs going on. And so obviously making the elderberry syrup is really great, but I also wanted to mention one more recipe out of the Creative Cooking Cookbook. Um, there's a few fun recipes in the back, like some Play-Doh and a few recipes that would be used at Amish weddings that you can make, which I think is really great. But there's also a recipe for garlic salve. And I am not going to demonstrate how to make this because I do have a batch here and it's something that I just kind of like to make as we need it. But let me tell you all, this has saved us on some very disrupted nights when it comes to coughing. Is this pleasant? No. <laughs> but when desperate times come, sometimes desperate measures are needed. So basically what is in this is coconut oil, um, garlic, raw garlic, you put it in your blender or food processor, and then a little bit of olive oil. It's all in here on how to do it. And then you can also add in your own essential oils. There's a few suggestions in here. I actually did some different essential oils. Um, and we put this on the chest and the bottom of the feet. And honestly, the day I made this, the night before my daughter was really up coughing and um, that night, whenever I used this, she was like, slept like a baby all night. So um, can't recommend this enough. It's so simple. You, can, you don't even need the essential oils if you just want to make it. Um, it. Like I said, is it pleasant? I mean, if you know what raw garlic smells like, <laughs> <laughs> you have a picture of probably what this smells like. But like I said, it is, I feel like a miracle worker. It's amazing. So I did want to mention that this thing is just packed with all kinds of fun things. And our rolls are almost ready. I keep peeking at them, trying to let them do their thing. Honestly, I think they're good to go. So I put them, spaced them out in here so they weren't really touching. And now they're touching, as you can see. So I'm going to go ahead. I have my oven preheated. And I believe um, we are to bake them for 15 to 20 minutes. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And I'm so excited to taste these. All right, as many of you know, if you watch my channel often, you know that I am an avid reader and I love books. And I just have wanted to share this little resource with you guys for a while. And interestingly enough, um, it comes from the same bookstore. It is the Golden Apples Bookstore that is in central Pennsylvania. And they're the ones that are offering this cookbook as well as other Mennonite and Amish cookbooks. But this book that I ran across this past year, it's actually, I think it was released this summer, is called A Cup of Cold Water. And I opened it up and started to flip through the pages. And my heart was just totally taken by what is in this book. In fact, so much so that I bought one for my mom I bought one for all three of my sister-in-laws and it makes an amazing gift. And it is a Mennonite background written book and it has basically loads and loads of inspiration and ideas of how to pass on kindness, how to bring community, how to share love and just really help those around you. There is different 
uh, categories in the book, things you can do for your elderly neighbors, things you can do for somebody that is grieving or maybe a new mom. And it just so inspired me and it's just something that I feel like should be shared. I feel like that every household needs one of these. If you are totally unfamiliar with the Amish or Mennonite background, there may be a few things that are a bit unfamiliar in what the church structure is like in a Mennonite church because there is some mention of that. But I think that anyone, anywhere can benefit from this and I just... I don't know, like I said, it is just one of my absolute favorite books. It's something that you can at any moment in time flip through. And I think so often whenever somebody has a new baby or they are going through a loss of a baby or maybe even there's even mention of people that are single in here and things you can do for them that we're like, how do we help? What do we do in those times of need? And this is just an amazing resource. So I will leave this linked below along with the cookbook and everything will be there, the information that you need. And one thing I love about this book is that it is written from the perspective of the women or people that you are focusing on. So it's written from the perspective of someone who's went through a loss. It's written from the perspective of a new mom. And so basically it's just stories of things that people did for other people that meant a lot to them. So it's like coming straight from the person that you may be trying to show kindness to and be a neighbor to. Neighbors is another um, category in this book. And I just think it's beautifully written, beautifully laid out. In fact, actually I should just crack it open and let you see. There is just pieces, bits and pieces. There's photos through the whole thing. It is just absolutely gorgeous. The friend I need here, this is the title, and it's just a little bit of inspiration. It's just amazing. So I had to share this. I've been wanting to share this on my channel, and I just keep kind of forgetting when I'm filming. And then when I was thinking about um, the resource of the bookstore today, I thought, you know what? I can go ahead and share this because I have a link for it and everything. So. Go ahead, check this out, check out the whole website and you'll find lots of great inspo as far as cookbooks and much, much more. But thank you so much for sticking around today. I will say this, quick little note if you didn't notice, I definitely think that recipe is for 24 rolls and not 12. Those rolls are massive. <laughs> My daughter came out to see them, she's like, mom, we're gonna have to share those. I said, I know they're huge. So the next time I make them, I definitely think I will divide them into two nine by 13 pans to make smaller rolls. But either way, they smell incredible. They're cooling right now. And I know that our family will really enjoy them with the cheeseburger soup this week. So if you are new here, I'd love it if you subscribed. And always, I love to hear from you guys in the comments and I love to chat with you all there. I hope you found some inspiration from today's video. Give this video a like, and I will see you all in the next one.